In this video, part 2 of the series Introduction to Simulating Nature with Quantum Computers, we'll dive a little deeper and get more technical. I'll walk you through the workflow from the last video, showing how we calculate whether a material is suitable for certain applications. We'll go step by step, not into every mathematical detail, but enough to give you a clear sense of why, once a molecule reaches a certain size, classical computation becomes practically impossible. I'll also highlight a study that shows how long these calculations actually take and at the end I'll give you a short outlook on what a real quantum computer would need in terms of qubits to solve such a problem. The more quantum specific discussion, including how this is actually implemented on a quantum computer and in Qiskit will be the focus of part 3. Now I'd like to go into how the mathematical process behind this actually works. Just to recap, our goal is to test whether material is suitable for a given application, for example, whether it could be superconducting at room temperature. There are certain parameters we can calculate that tell us whether that's the case. Not just superconductivity, but also properties like the hardness of the material, whether it can be easily processed, and so on. To obtain these values, the first step is to calculate the ground state wave function and the ground state energy. I now sketch how this calculation works and point out the specific step that makes the process so computationally demanding. The step where a quantum computer could become useful. The first step is straightforward, we write down the Schrödinger equation. In its simplest form, this says that the Hamiltonian acting on the wave function equals the energy times the wave function. Nothing too difficult so far. And the challenge lies in the next step, constructing the Hamiltonian properly. And for those who aren't physicists and may have never heard of the Schrödinger equation, here's a short summary. So the Schrödinger equation is essentially the fundamental law of quantum mechanics, the very core of the theory. It describes how a quantum system evolves in space and time. The second step is to set up the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is the heart of the Schrödinger equation. It contains all the information about the kinetic energy of the particles and their interactions. For example, how electrons move, how they are attracted to the atomic nucleus and how they repel one another. All of that information is encoded in the Hamiltonian. Once we have a complete Hamiltonian, then we have a complete description of the system. And with that, we've also fully defined the problem. That already takes us a long way. The rest is then just mathematics. But calling it just mathematics is an understatement because the really difficult step is still to come. In the next step we have to choose what's called a basis set. But why do we need to do this? For those who haven't studied linear algebra or physics this may sound a bit abstract so let me try to make it clear. We describe the wave function in an infinite dimensional space called a Hilbert space. That might sound highly mathematical, but there is a very practical reason for it. Instead of describing the wave function in the usual three dimensional coordinate system with x, y and c, we use the Hilbert space. A Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. That means it doesn't just have three dimensions, but infinitely many. In our everyday coordinate systems, each axis is continuous, meaning you can take infinitely many values along it. In Hilbert space it works differently. Each basis vector corresponds to a specific quantum state the particle could occupy. For example a state localized at a certain position, or one with a specific momentum. Since a particle can in principle occupy infinitely many positions and have infinitely many momenta, the Hilbert space ends up being infinite dimensional. Now we can choose to describe the system either in the position basis or in the momentum basis. In most cases the position basis is more convenient. But depending on the problem, sometimes the momentum basis is more practical. You can think of this choice like picking between Cartesian coordinates or polar coordinates. Both are valid, but sometimes one makes the problem simpler than the other. So what happens is this. Our wave function is in a superposition of all possible basis states in the Hilbert space. In other words, 
The wave function, which describes our particle or molecule, is a vector in this infinite dimensional space, expressed as a combination of all basis vectors. Of course, not all basis vectors contribute equally, many contribute only a tiny amount, while others have a much larger contribution. This brings us to the practical issue. Because the Hilbert space has infinitely many basis vectors, we can't work with all of them. Instead, we must pick a finite set of basis vectors that captures the most important contributions to the wave function. The more basis states we include, the more accurately we describe the system. But the trade-off is that the computational cost increases dramatically. You can think of this like zooming in with a digital camera. The higher the resolution, the more detail you capture, but the more memory and processing power you need. That's why basis choice is so crucial. It's about balancing accuracy and computational feasibility. To make this more tangible, let's use Fourier analysis. Any function can be written as a sum of infinitely many sine and cosine terms, each with a certain frequency. In practice, we can't use them all, so we approximate the function with a finite number. It's the same with the Hilbert space. The wave function is a combination of infinitely many basis vectors but in practice we select only a subset to make the problem solvable. Before we calculate the individual matrix elements, let me quickly explain what a matrix actually is. As you can see here, I have written down an example of a matrix, just to remind everyone what it looks like. Most of you probably already know this, but for those who don't, a matrix is an object from linear algebra. And what does a matrix do? It takes a vector and produces a new vector. In other words, a matrix is a rule that tells us how a vector changes in space. This is exactly what the Hamiltonian operator does in quantum mechanics. It takes a state, our state vector, and tells us how this state changes according to the physical laws of the system, which include kinetic and potential energy. At the moment, however, the Hamiltonian is still just an abstract operator. It is not yet written in the language of linear algebra. So we now translate it into a matrix representation, which allows us to work with our state vectors using the familiar tools of linear algebra. How do we do this? First, we choose a basis set. Then, we take one basis vector at a time. We apply the Hamiltonian operator to this basis vector, and that gives us a new function, or in other words, a new vector in Hilbert space. But just having this new function is not enough information. To understand how the Hamiltonian really acts, we need to measure how strongly this new vector overlaps with all the other basis vectors in our basis set. These overlaps are exactly what we call the matrix elements. Each matrix element describes how much the Hamiltonian, when applied to one basis vector, points in the direction of another basis vector. If we do this for every combination of basis vectors, we determine all the matrix elements and can gradually build up the full Hamiltonian matrix. And now, in the fifth and final step, we solve this eigenvalue problem. Because what we have now is nothing more than a matrix on the left hand side, acting on a vector, and on the right hand side, a scalar, our energy values, times the same vector. And that is exactly what an eigenvalue problem is. The difficulty is that our Hamiltonian matrix can become absolutely enormous, and the larger it gets, the harder it becomes to solve what is called an eigenvalue problem. For those who haven't studied linear algebra, an eigenvalue problem means nothing more than this simple equation. A matrix times a vector equals a number times the same vector. In words, if we apply the matrix to a certain vector, and here that vector is our wave function, the result is just the same vector again, but scaled by some number. The direction stays the same, only the length changes. And that scaling number is the eigenvalue. So in essence, an eigenvalue problem is just finding those special vectors that are not rotated by the matrix, but simply stretched or shrunk. That's all it means. The problem is that in quantum mechanics, the Hamiltonian matrix can become unimaginably large. And once the matrix is that big, solving this eigenvalue problem becomes incredibly demanding. And that is exactly the challenge we're facing here. 
I want to take a closer look at why this problem becomes so extremely demanding for large molecules. The basic process looks like this, although in reality it isn't done exactly this way. In practice there are approximation techniques and iterative algorithms that make the calculations manageable. But what I'm showing here represents the underlying process at its core. On the left we see a simple 4x4 matrix, 4 rows and 4 columns. On the right we see another 4x4 matrix, but this one has zeros everywhere except on the diagonal. The process of turning the left matrix into the right one is called diagonalization. Why do we do this? Because the non-zero numbers on the diagonal are exactly the eigenvalues, and in quantum mechanics these correspond to the energies of the system. If you'd like a deeper and very visual explanation of how this works in linear algebra, I highly recommend the free blue one brown video series on linear algebra, which I have linked in the video description. The real problem arises when we want to describe molecules with say 100 atoms and we want to do it fully, without approximations. Then our matrices are no longer small, like 4 times 4, but unimaginably huge, with dimensions on the order of 10 to the power of 100 by 10 to the power of 100, or even larger. That means we'd have a matrix with a 1 followed by 100 zeros, rows, and the same number of columns. A matrix of that size is not only impossible to compute, it's impossible even to write down. And that is exactly why fully describing large molecules becomes computationally intractable. At the end of the whole process I described before, we end up with an n by n matrix. Diagonalizing such a matrix costs on the order of n to the power of 3 operations. That doesn't mean there is one fixed number of operations, but it gives the correct scaling and that scaling is n to the power of 3. For example, if we have a 1000 by 1000 matrix, that's about 10 to the power of 9 operations, or roughly 1 gigaflop. That is still quite feasible for a modern computer, something that can be done in seconds. But if we go up to something like 50,000 by 50,000, then we already have about 10 to the power of 14 operations. On a normal PC, that would take days. This quick back of the envelope calculation assumes that we really perform a full diagonalization without any approximations. That's not what is actually done in practice, but it helps give you an intuition for just how quickly the computational cost explodes. What is also important to note is that there are also several different methods for setting up the Hamiltonian matrix. I didn't specify this earlier, but if you were to build the Hamiltonian matrix for a real molecule with say 100 electrons, the result would be a gigantic object. Strictly speaking, it's not even a simple matrix anymore, but more like a tensor. But I don't want to go into too much detail here. What matters is that nowadays we don't actually calculate the full Hamiltonian for all possible electron configurations. That would be completely unmanageable. Instead, we use approximate methods. Two of the most common ones are Hart tree fog and DFT, so density functional theory. These are approximations that capture much of the physics, but in a computationally efficient way without explicitly describing every possible electron combination. And then, at the other end of the spectrum, there is FCI, Full Configuration Interaction. This is considered the gold standard. With FCI and a sufficiently large basis set, you could in principle describe the system almost completely. And for completeness, here are also three basis sets you can choose from depending on the desired accuracy and available computational power. I've chosen a study that I will also link in the video description. And in this study the authors looked at the molecule C3H8, which is propane. They used the minimal basis set STO3G and applied the FCI method, the gold standard where the system is described in its entirety. That means every possible electron configuration of this molecule is taken into account. The computer they used was the ABCI supercomputer in Japan. It's not the best supercomputer in the world, but it's still a very powerful one. If you're interested in the technical details, you find them in the paper itself. And what they found is that it took 113.6 hours, which is almost 5 full days, to carry out this calculation for propane. 
So what we see here is that if we really want to describe a system fully and as accurately as possible, it takes an enormous amount of time. And keep in mind, propane is a molecule with just 11 atoms. That's not very large at all. There are biomolecules, proteins for example, that have hundreds or even thousands of atoms. For those, carrying out such a calculation in the same way would be completely out of reach. To sum up, FCI is the most accurate method we have for simulating molecules. Approximations like DFT or Hartree-Fock are much faster, but they are far less reliable. Sometimes they give results that simply don't match reality. In the study we looked at, even for a small molecule like propane, just 11 atoms, it took 5 full days on a supercomputer to run FCI in a minimal basis. The Hamiltonian matrix in this case would likely be on the order of about 10 to the power of 12 by 10 to the power of 12. I can't say that with 100% certainty, but that should be roughly the scale we are talking about here. For larger molecules, especially in biology where we deal with hundreds of thousands of atoms, these matrices explode to sizes like 10 to the power of 100 by 10 to the power of 100, or even larger. At that point, the problem becomes flat out impossible for classical computers. And that's the key takeaway. If we want to simulate large complex molecules in full detail and with true precision, there is no way around quantum computers. That is where their real transformative potential lies, and why they could change entire fields from material science to biology. And now I'd like to say a few words about how this would look on a quantum computer. A regular quantum computer would need only about 46 logical qubits to solve the propane problem. I can't say with 100% certainty that this number is exact, I didn't work it out myself, I asked several AIs and 46 seemed to be a reasonable estimate. So let's take it as an order of magnitude and not an exact figure. Now these would have to be logical qubits, meaning error corrected qubits. For our problem we'd need on the order of 20,000 to 100,000 physical qubits in total to realize about 46 logical qubits. Today's devices have about 1000 physical qubits and IBM has announced that by 2029 they aim to build a system with around 200 logical qubits. How reliable those qubits will be or whether they would already be sufficient for chemistry problems like this one remains unclear. It's important to stress that these calculations on a quantum computer are not instantaneous. Even with error corrected qubits, propane would still take minutes to hours, but that's a huge improvement over the 5 days on a supercomputer. For a molecule with around 100 atoms, we're talking about hours to days. That may sound long, but the key is, on a classical computer, this level of accuracy is simply impossible. The real breakthrough is that results would be much more reliable. Instead of testing thousands of candidates in the lab, we could directly compute solutions with high confidence. So it's not about instant answers, but about moving from impossible to a few days. And that is already a massive leap. And with that, I'll end this video. In the next one, we'll take a closer look at how these calculations are actually carried out on a quantum computer, how the qubits are scaled, how the setup looks in practice and how we can model a molecule step by step. I first sketch the theory and then we'll dive into Qiskit with a small program to simulate H2 and explore how Qiskit nature works internally. I'd be happy if you tune in again. See you then.